Greetings, everybody. Chaplain Bob Walker here, Light of the World Ministries. In John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. This is going to be the continuation of the Ezekiel series. We're going to be working on chapter 40. Most people say this is the Ezekiel's temple. Ezekiel's temple. I don't see a lot of information on that, but uh, we're going to read it anyways because it's, it's in the book. So Ezekiel chapter 40, verse 1. In the five and twentieth year of our captivity, so, you know, they're in, they're in captivity. The temple's been destroyed. There's nothing going on. I mean, it, this is all so anything he sees concerning this stuff has to be future, my opinion. In the five and twentieth year of our captivity, in the beginning of the year, in the tenth day of the month, in the fourteenth year, after that the city was smitten, in the selfsame day the hand of the Lord was upon me and brought me thither. In the visions of God brought he me into the land of Israel, and set me upon a very high mountain, by which was as the frame of a city on the south. And he brought me thither, and behold, there was a man whose appearance was like the appearance of brass, with a line of flax in his hand, and a measuring reed, and he stood in the gate. Uh, you know, you use a, a string, you know, a line of flax and a measuring reed. I guess that's like a measuring rod, you know, like a yardstick or something or a meter stick. I don't know what they use in Europe. And he stood in the gate. Verse four. And the man said unto me, Son of man, behold, with thine eyes and hear with thine ears. And set thine heart upon all that I shall show thee. For to the intent that I might show them unto thee, art thou brought hither, declare all that thou seest to the house of Israel. And behold, a wall on the outside of the house, round about, in the man's hand a measuring reed of six cubits long. So that's about three meters or three yards. Because a cubit is approximately half a meter or 18 inches. In the man's hand, a measuring reed of six cubits long by the cubit and an hand breadth. So he measured the breadth of the building. One reed and the height one reed. Then came he unto the gate, which looketh toward the east, and went up the stairs thereof, and measured the threshold of the gate, which was one reed broad, and the other threshold of the gate, which was one reed broad. It doesn't seem very big, does it? Maybe I'm missing something here. Verse 7. And every little chamber was one reed long and one reed broad. And between the little chambers were five cubits and the threshold of the gate by the porch of the gate within was one reed. He measured also the porch of the gate within one reed. Then measured he the porch of the gate, eight cubits, and the post thereof two cubits, and the porch of the gate was inward. And the little chambers of the gate eastward were three on this side and three on that side. They three were of one measure, and the post had one measure on this side and on that side. 
and he measured the breadth of the entry of the gate, 10 cubits, and the length of the gate, 13 cubits. The space also before the little chambers was one cubit on this side, and the space was one cubit on that side, and the little chambers were six cubits on this side, and six cubits on that side. He measured then the gate from the roof of one little chamber to the roof of another. The breadth was five and twenty cubits, door against door. He made also posts of three score cubits, even unto the post of the court round about the gate. Verse 15. And from the face of the gate of the entrance unto the face of the porch of the inner gate were fifty cubits. And there were narrow windows to the little chambers and to their posts within the gate round about and likewise to the arches, and windows were round about inward, and upon each post were palm trees. What did, uh, what did people put in the, the way to Jerusalem when Jesus rode on the donkey into Jerusalem? Didn't they put palm leaves? Oh yeah. I don't know if that has anything to do with it, but... I thought I would mention. Verse 17, Then brought he me into the outward court, and lo, there were chambers and a pavement made for the, round, uh, for the court round about. Thirty chambers were upon the pavement. And the pavement by the side of the gates, over against the length of the gates, was the lower pavement. Then he measured the breadth of the forefront of the lower gate unto the forefront of the inner court without, and a hundred cubits eastward and northward. And the gate of the outward court that looked toward the north, he measured the length thereof and the breadth thereof. And the little chambers thereof were three on this side and three on that side. And the posts thereof and the arches thereof were after the measure of the first gate, the length thereof was 50 cubits, and the breadth 5 and 20 cubits. Now that's fairly decent size, right? And their windows and their arches and their palm trees were after the measure of the gate that looketh toward the east, and they went up unto it by seven steps, and the arches thereof were before them. And the gate of the inner court was over against the gate toward the north and toward the east, and he measured from gate to gate an hundred cubits. After that he brought me toward the south, and behold, a gate toward the south, and he measured the posts thereof and the arches thereof according to these measures. And there were windows in it, and in the arches thereof round about, like those windows, the length was fifty cubits, and the breadth five and twenty cubits. And there were seven steps to go up to it. And the arches thereof were before them, and it had palm trees, one on this side and another on that side, upon the posts thereof. And there was a gate in the inner court toward the south, and he measured from gate to gate toward the south an hundred cubits. And he brought me to the inner court by the south gate, and he measured the south gate according to these measures. And the little chambers thereof, and the posts thereof, and the arches thereof, according to these measures, and there were windows in it, and the arches thereof round about it, it was fifty cubits long and five and twenty cubits broad. And the arches round about were five and twenty cubits long and five cubits broad. And the arches thereof were toward the utter court and had palm trees 
were upon the posts thereof, and the going up to it had eight steps. And he brought me into the inner court toward the east, and he measured the gate according to these measures. And the little chambers thereof, and the posts thereof, and the arches thereof, were according to these measures, and there were windows therein, and in the arches thereof, round about, it was fifty cubits long, and five and twenty cubits broad. And the arches thereof were toward the outward court, and palm trees were upon the posts thereof, on this side and on that side, and the going up to it had eight steps. Verse 35, And he brought me to the north gate, and measured it according to these measures. The little chambers thereof, the posts thereof, and the arches thereof, and the windows to it round about, the length was fifty cubits, and the breadth five and twenty cubits. And the posts thereof were toward the utter court, and palm trees were upon the posts thereof, on this side and on that side, and the going up to it had eight steps. And the chambers and the entries thereof were by the posts of the gates, where they washed the burnt offering. And in the porch of the gate were two tables on this side, and two tables on that side, to slay thereon the burnt offering, to slay thereon the burnt offering and the sin offering and the trespass offering. So there you go. This is some type of tabernacle, temple type worship. So there's going to be a burnt offering, a sin offering, and a trespass offering. So some people say that this is in the time of Christ's return. And we'll get more into that later. Verse 40, And at the side without, as one goeth up to the entry of the north gate, were two tables, and on the other side, which was the porch of the gate, were two tables. Four tables were on this side, and four tables on that side, by the side of the gate eight tables, whereupon they slew their sacrifices. And the four tables were of hewn stone for the burnt offering, of a cubit and a half long and a cubit and a half broad, and one cubit high, whereupon also they laid the instruments wherewith they slew the burnt offering and the sacrifice. And within were hooks, and hand broad, fastened round about, and upon the tables was the flesh of the offering. And without the inner gate were the chambers of the singers in the inner court. So they got singers. And no, we're not talking about a sewing machine. Which was at the side of the north gate, and their prospect was toward the south, one at the side of the east gate, having prospect toward the north. And he said unto me, This chamber, whose prospect is toward the south, is for the priests, the priests, the keepers of the charge of the house. Huh. So they're going to have sacrifices and they're going to have priests. And the chamber whose prospect is toward the north is for the priests, the keepers of the charge of the altar. These are the sons of Zadok among the sons of Levi. Now, Levi was one of the twelve tribes. He was the tribe of the priests. They were the ones that were to serve God. That was their job, to serve God. Temple, tabernacle, doing the sacrifices, that was their job. Reading the law. Judah was the king tribe, the civil ruler. Uh, the Levites, if it had anything to do with uh, God's law, that was them. 
the king was the one that went to war. And Zadok was a very special priest who was around in the days of King David and Solomon. All right, so these are the sons of Zadok among the sons of Levi, which come near to the Lord to minister unto him. So he measured the court and hundred cubits long and a hundred cubits broad, four square, and the altar that was before the house. And he brought me to the porch of the house and measured each post of the porch, five cubits on this side and five cubits on that side. And the breadth of the gate was three cubits on this side and three cubits on that side. The length of the porch was 20 cubits and the breadth 11 cubits. And he brought me to the steps whereby they went up to it. And there were pillars by the posts, one on this side and another on that side. Uh, some people, from what I understand, say that this was the temple in the days of Jesus and King Herod. Others, but the great majority, say that this is the future. This is during the thousand-year reign of Christ. Why would that be? Why would there be a temple in the thousand-year reign of Christ? Wasn't Christ uh, did away with uh, temple worship? You, I mean, really, think about it. All right, let's take a look at John chapter 2, verse 13. And the Jews' Passover was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and the changers of money sitting. So Jesus goes to the temple. And when he had made a scourge of small cords, what's a scourge? It's a whip. What would Jesus do? Uh, taking a whip of cords and whipping people with them is not out of the question. Absolutely. And when he had made a scourge of small cords, he drove them all out of the temple and the sheep and the oxen and poured out the money, uh, the, poured out the changers' money and overthrew the tables. Boy, Jesus, you're, you just don't know how to get along with those denominational leaders. I mean, come on now. You're supposed to be this loving guy that just loves everybody. And Jesus is getting ready to say something here. Verse 16, And said unto them that sold doves, Take these things hence, make not my father's house an house of merchandise. And his disciples remembered that it was written, The zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. Then answered the Jews and said unto him, what sign showest thou unto us, seeing that thou doest these things? Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? But he spake of the temple of his body. Huh. So, if Jesus is speaking about the temple of his body, why would there have to be another one? Hmm. All right, well, let's go read what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. And, uh, yeah, watch out for those Hebrew roots people that hate Paul. And I want to get rid of all his writings. Matter of fact, you know, I've heard some of these Hebrew Roots people that say that they actually have to start doing temple sacrifice again. I mean, they claim that they believe in Yeshua, but temple sacrifice? Really? No, they're devils. 
There are antichrists. And not all Hebrew Roots people believe that stuff, but uh, I've some of them do. And just the fact that they're hanging out with each other, you know, if the real Hebrew Roots people were for real, they'd be rebuking those saying that they need to do animal sacrifices. That's a total denial of what Christ did on the cross. Total denial. And you'll find they're very friendly with the Noahides. Look into that. Seven Laws of Noah. Uh, find that in the Bible and uh, show me in the Bible where Noah was given seven laws. And I'll send you a hundred dollar bill. Of course, you'll never collect because it's not in there. Oh, and you got to use the King James Bible, by the way. Uh, 1 Corinthians 3.16 Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. So if Christ was talking about the temple of his body, and we are part of that body and part of the temple of God, what in the world is a temple going to be doing in the future? That don't make no sense, does it? Well, actually it does. All right, let's read Isaiah 65. I mean, I did this in another study. I did an entire commentary on Isaiah. Isaiah is a very, very interesting book. I, I think it's right up there in importance with uh, Genesis. I mean, all the books in the Bible are important. It's just some seem like they're more important or relevant than others. I consider the book of Isaiah a lot more important than, say, the book of Esther. But, what can I tell you? Isaiah 65, verse 1. I am sought of them that asked not for me. I am found of them that sought me not. I said, Behold me, behold me, unto a nation that was not called by my name. And I think that nation was divorced Israel, Jeremiah 3, eight, whom God divorced. I have spread out my hands all the day unto a rebellious people. Well, that's Israel, all right. Which walketh in a way that was not good after their own thoughts. A people that provoketh me to anger continually to my face that sacrificeth in gardens and burneth incense unto altars of brick, which remain among the graves and lodge in the monuments, which eat swine's flesh and broth of abominable things in their vessels. Huh. Hey, what are you going to have for uh, Easter dinner? Hey, we're going to have ham. Come on over. Uh, I think I'll pass. Verse 5. Here's, here's the for the Baptists and the you-know-who's over in the Middle East. Which say, stand by thyself. Come not near to me, for I am holier than thou. Hmm. Stay away from me. I'm holier than thou. For I am holier than thou. These are a smoke in my nose, a fire that burneth all the day. Behold, it is written before me, I will not keep silence, but will recompense, even recompense into their bosom. Your iniquities and the iniquities of your fathers together, saith the Lord, which have burned incense upon the mountains and blasphemed me upon the hills. Therefore will I measure their former work into their bosom. Thus saith the Lord, As the new wine is found in the cluster, and one saith, Destroy it not, for, for a blessing is in it. 
so will I do for my servants' sakes, that I may not destroy them all. And I will bring forth a seed out of Jacob and out of Judah, an inheritor of my mountains, and mine elect, and mine elect shall inherit it, and my servants shall dwell there. Boy, I'll tell you what, the free will, whosoever will people, they hate that word elect. Unless, of course, you're talking about the Antichrist over in the Middle East, then that's okay. Verse 10. And Sharon shall be a fold of flocks, and the valley of Achor a place for the herds to lie down in, for my people that have sought me. But ye are they that forsake the Lord, that forget my holy mountain, that prepare a table for that troop, and that furnish the drink offering unto that number. Therefore will I number you to the sword, and ye shall all bow down to the slaughter, because when I called, when I called, ye did not answer. When I spake, ye did not hear, but did evil before mine eyes, and did choose that wherein I delighted not. The Lord called them, but they didn't hear it. You ever notice, uh, well, I'm a little older than most people. Back when I was a kid, we had an ice cream truck that would run up and down the streets of the neighborhood, and we'd grab a quarter or whatever and go running out to meet it. It's funny, a you know, a uh, kid's mother could be yelling her lungs out, Hey, little Johnny, come home! Come home! He couldn't hear that, but boy, if that ice cream truck was half a mile away, oh boy, he'd hear that. Well, that's how these people are. The Lord would call them and they wouldn't hear. They wouldn't listen. Verse 13. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, my servants shall eat, but ye shall be hungry. Behold, my servants shall drink, but ye shall be thirsty. Behold, my servants shall rejoice, but ye shall be ashamed. Behold, my servants shall sing for joy of heart, but ye shall cry for sorrow of heart, and shall howl for vexation of spirit. And ye shall leave your name for a curse unto my chosen. Oh, chosen! Oh, we can't have chosen people! Well, unless, of course, it's the Antichrist over in the Middle East. You know, churches absolutely detest the idea that those in Christ could actually be his chosen people. They absolutely detest that idea. Absolutely. And ye shall leave your name for a curse unto my chosen, for the Lord God shall slay thee and call his servants by another name. Huh, the Lord's going to call his servants by another name. Uh, could that be Christian? Christians? Huh, I wonder. Verse 16. That he who blesseth, blesseth himself in the earth shall bless himself in the God of truth. And he that sweareth in the earth shall swear by the God of truth, because the former troubles are forgotten, and because they are hid from mine eyes. Verse 17, listen to this. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth. Well, that's, that's in a couple places, but that's in the book of Revelation. I think it's in 2 Peter too. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth. And the former shall not be remembered, nor come into mind. But be glad and rejoice forever 
in that which I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem a rejoicing and her people a joy. Now remember, Jerusalem come, New Jerusalem comes down from heaven. And I will rejoice in Jerusalem and joy in my people. And the voice of weeping shall be no more heard in her, nor the voice of crying. There shall be no more fence an infant of days, nor an old man that hath not filled his days. For the child shall die an hundred years old, but the sinner being an hundred years old shall be accursed. And they shall build houses and inhabit them, and they shall plant vineyards and eat the fruit of them. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For as the days of a tree are the days of my people, and mine elect shall long enjoy the work of their hands. They shall not labor in vain, nor bring forth for trouble, for they are the seed of the blessed of the Lord, and their offspring with them. And it shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer. And while they are yet speaking, I will hear. Verse 25. Now remember, this is the new earth and the new heavens. Verse 25. And don't fall for this Mandela effect. That's a, a lie from hell. Well, what is the Mandela effect? Well, I think it's named for that Nelson Mandela, that black communist in South Africa that was uh, our, his his heathens were armed by the you-know-whos to kill off all the, the white Christians over there. But uh, the African National Congress, the ANC, but uh, what they do is, well, there's a couple variations, but basically they're saying that uh, Satan's going back in time and changing the Bibles. Or... Satan's uh, casting a magic spell and the Bibles are changing. And they'll say, oh, this doesn't mean wolf. This is, used to be lion. And the thing was, Elvis Presley sang a song where he talked about the lion laying down with the lamb. And then pastors, well, you know, like Billy Goat Graham, we're all putting that into their sermons. Oh, the lion's going to lay down with the lamb. And you remember that. And then you read the King James Bible and it says the wolf. And they're like, oh, the Bible changed. Boy, if that's true, then you know what? Go join the Church of Satan because God is unable to stop Satan from changing the Bible. Seriously. If you want to believe that, Join the Church of Satan because you want to believe Satan's more powerful than God and Satan can change the Bible and God can't do anything to stop him. Join the Church of Satan. Join the winning team. Go for it. And I'm not being facetious. I'm really not. I'm, I'm dead serious. I absolutely... These people, honestly, they believe that God was unable to stop Satan from changing the Bible. Seriously, that's what the Mandela Effect's all about. You'll hear about it if you're on the uh, internet long enough. You know, I'm glad I was seminary trained. Or I mean, cemetery. Because um, I had a fairly good foundation with a lot of that stuff. And, you know, I had to study I've spent a lot of time studying. All right. Verse 25. Isaiah 65, 25. The wolf and the lamb shall feed together. Oh, Chaplain Bob, that used to say lion. No, it didn't. No, it didn't. It's always been the wolf and the lamb. The wolf and the lamb shall feed together, and the lion shall eat straw like the bullock. Uh, are lions eating straw? 
Uh, no. No, they're not. So this has got to be future. And the lion shall eat straw like the bullock, and dust shall be the serpent's meat. And they shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, saith the Lord. So if lions are going to be eating straw, you know it's got to be the future. All right, let's go to Isaiah 11, verse 1. And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse. Who was Jesse? Jesse was the father of David the king. And a branch shall grow out of his roots. Well, guess what? Christ was reckoned of the lineage of Joseph, who was of the tribe of Judah. Mary was of the tribe of Levi. So, who are they talking about here? A rod out of the stem of Jesse and a branch shall grow out of his roots. They're speaking of Christ. Verse 2. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. What did John the Baptist see when he baptized Christ? He saw the 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 dove come down, right? Well, let's read that. Matthew 3.16 And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him. And he, John, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. Mark 1.10 And straightway coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens opened and the Spirit like a dove descending upon him. Luke 3, 22. And the Holy Spirit descended in a bodily shape like a dove upon him, and a voice came from heaven which said, Thou art my beloved Son, in thee I am well pleased. John 1, 32. And John bare record, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him. Back to Isaiah 11, verse 2. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord, and shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord, and he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears. But with righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth. And with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. Well, that's going to, that's in the future. Doesn't the Bible say that God's going to, Jesus, uh, had a sharp two-edged sword come out of his mouth? Well, the words, right? And he's going to rule with a rod of iron? Oh, yeah. Verse 5. And righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins, and faithfulness the girdle of his reins. Verse 6. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb. And everybody says, oh, it's a lion. Mandela effect? I don't think so. And the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. And the cow and the bear shall feed, and their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. Well, last time I looked at National Geographic and they had a thing on about lions, they were not eating an, uh, straw. Verse 8. Now, this is the future. It has to be. You know, when a lion is eating straw, you know it's the kingdom. Verse 8. Listen to this carefully. And the sucking child, that means a child that's uh, still hasn't been weaned yet. It's, you know, getting its mother's milk. And the sucking child shall play in the hole of the asp. What's an asp? A very deadly snake. 
very venomous snake. And the sucking child shall play on the hole of the asp, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the cockatrice den. They shall not hurt nor destroy. Ah, so these snakes are not going to hurt or destroy. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Now, remember this. There's going to be little children in the kingdom. Where do these children come from? Because Jesus says, Jesus said there won't be any marriage in heaven. So where do these children come from? Well, let me keep going and we'll get back to that. I mean, here it is. Absolutely, there are children in the kingdom. Verse 9, they shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And in that day there shall be a root of Jesse, which shall stand for an ensign of the people, to it shall the Gentiles seek, and his rest shall be glorious. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time, to recover the remnant of his people, which shall be left from Assyria and from Egypt and from Pathros and from Cush and from Elam and from Shinar and from Hamath and from the islands of the sea. What islands of the sea? Well, Greece, uh, possibly Crete. Uh, how about England? Great Britain. Scotland, Ireland, how about them? Verse 12, And he shall set up an ensign of the nations, and shall assemble the outcasts of Israel, and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. The envy also of Ephraim shall depart, and the adversaries of Judah shall be cut off. Ephraim, which was uh, Israel, Ephraim shall not envy Judah, and Judah shall not vex Ephraim. All right, let's go take a look at uh, children. All right, let's go to Matthew 22, uh, verse 23. Now, remember, the Sadducees were the, uh, they were sort of kind of like the Levites, and they only accepted the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. If you were a temple priest, the book of Exodus, I'm sorry, the book of Leviticus was extremely important because that had all the temple rituals or the tabernacle. But they didn't accept the Psalms, they didn't accept the book of Isaiah, they didn't accept any of that. All right. Matthew 22 and verse 23. The same day came to him the Sadducees, which say that there is no resurrection. And asked him, saying, Master, Moses said, If a man die, having no children, his brother shall marry his wife and raise up seed unto his brother. You know, raise up children. Now there were with us seven brethren, and the first, when he had married a wife, deceased, and having no issue, no children, left his wife unto his brother. Likewise the second also, and the third unto the seventh. And last of all, the woman died also. Therefore, in the resurrection, whose wife shall she be of the seven? For they all had her. Oh boy, you don't want to ask Jesus a trick question because he's going to make you look foolish. Verse 29. Jesus answered and said unto them, Ye do err. That's where you get the word error. You're wrong, people. Ye do err, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. For in the resurrection, they neither marry, for in the resurrection, they neither marry, nor are given in marriage, but are the, but are as the angels of God in heaven. 
Now, when you talk to people about uh, Genesis chapter 6, when somebody tries to tell you that the sons of God in Genesis 6, uh, before the flood, were angels, they'll always go to this verse and say, See, see, for in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given a marriage, but are the but are as the angels of God. See, see, angels cannot have sex. Impossible. But they leave out those two last words. In heaven. But are as the angels of God in heaven. They always leave those last two words out. Because guess what, people? All the angels are not in heaven. Some of them were cast out to the earth, a third of them. And then they'll try to tell you that's future too. Oh, really? Jesus said, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. And that was 2,000 or so years ago, approximately. And that is in Luke 10, 18. And he, Jesus, said unto them, I beheld Satan as as lightning fall from heaven. Well, that was past. Past. You know, Jesus didn't say, well, one day, one day in the future, uh, Satan's going to fall from heaven like lightning. No. I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Past. Back to Matthew 22, verse 30. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given a marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. But as touching the resurrection of the dead, have ye not read that which was spoken unto you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob? God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. So all those people that believe in soul sleep uh, argue with Jesus. Now, if there's no marriage in heaven and they're not having babies, where are these children coming from in the kingdom that are playing with deadly snakes? You know, a cockatrice is a very deadly snake too. And these lions that are eating straw with the ox, where do these children come from? Well, the only logical conclusion is they were the children that died in childbirth, died in abortions, or died before a certain age, and they'll be given a chance to grow up in the kingdom. Think about it. Maybe that's where this temple comes in. They're going to have to do temple sacrifice until they accept the sacrifice that Christ did, like every other believer, and are born of the Spirit. And then the sacrifice in the temple will be irrelevant again. That's the Bob theory. Uh, I might have some things wrong, but... Generally, as an overview, I think that's the way it's going to work. And if I'm wrong, may the Lord forgive me because I'm not trying to intentionally deceive anybody. So, but most Bible so-called scholars say that Ezekiel chapter 40 is the temple during the millennial reign of Christ. The first resurrection. I mean, what's God going to do with uh, all the children that were aborted? And you're talking millions in just the United States. Millions. Millions just in the United States alone. Not even counting Europe. Millions. Abortion's been legal since 1973, if memory serves me correctly. I was in high school. That was the year I... Sign the dotted line for the join the military. 
And somebody told me that uh, there's an average of two to three million abortions every year in the United States. Could be higher. Do the math. 83, 93, 2003, 2013. Almost. It's going on 50 years, people. It's close to 50 years. So maybe the numbers are way up there. So there's going to be a lot of kids that are going to be in the kingdom that are going to have to hear about Jesus. And hopefully I'll be around to let them know, hey, there's this guy named Jesus. Yeah. So, I don't know. Uh, getting through Ezekiel 40, I know it was a it was kind of slow getting started, but uh, yeah. All right, well, all blessings, praise, glory, and honor to God the Father and His only begotten Son, Jesus, who is the Christ, the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor in Jesus' precious name. Amen.